Please join me in welcoming Professor Alessandro Portelli. Good evening. I'm really excited to be here, and uh, I've been impressed by the, um, my visit at the Oral History Center. I've been awed this morning at the Ukrainian uh, labor temple, and, uh, and I've been enjoying the acquaintance uh, or reacquaintance with uh, so many, so many pleasant and, uh, and interesting people in what seems to me a, a nice, pleasant town that I had never really considered visiting. So it's, <laughs> it's really exciting to, be, to have been given this, uh, this opportunity. So thank you for having me here. And um, I hope we will spend a, a few days together, a few, a few rewarding days together. So what I um, uh, like to talk tonight about and is uh, the uses of memory and the ways uh, and different uh, and the ways in which different forms of memory had different uses and this uh, line of thought was uh, set in motion by a recent book by a, a popular linguist Stefano Bartezzaghi who um, wrote a book on uh, contemporary uh, linguistic communication and he repeated this old, worn-out cliche, uh, memory is harmful, memory is bad, because it dooms us to always repeat the same actions and thoughts, and it overwhelms us with the weight of the past. This is a long-standing uh, you know, debate. In 1981, before I published a, a Trastulli uh, article, uh, at a conference on uh, the renewal of radical politics, there was a, a, uh, a quarrel, really, uh, um, uh, between the Foucaultian uh, workerist left that said memory is bad for the same reason, uh, it's a weight of the past, and mm, some of the people that I had been working with, the the well, the right wing of the extreme left, uh, to, <laughs> of which I've always been a proud member, and um, that, uh, that have been working on you know, the history and memory of the working classes of the labor movements and uh, the popular world. And this is a debate, in fact, whether memory is good or bad that makes no sense at all. Memory is neither good or bad. Memory just is. We're born with it. And there is no way you can uh, stop remembering. Uh, memory acts very much like uh, like an involuntary muscle. Memory, like breathing. I mean, uh, nobody questions whether breathing is good or bad. You just breathe. Uh, what you, what we can do with breathing is improve our the capacity of our lungs and try to, you know have clean air around us. And this is more or less what we can do with memory. We cannot decide to re whether we want to remember or, to, or forget. We can work on our capacity to remember critically, and we can try to clear the air of f manipulated and, uh, memories that are imposed upon us. In fact, uh, while it may be true that too much memory may choke the imagination. Uh, an absence of memory uh, may uh, actually make us forget that certain things have already been done, have already been tried, and like some of our Foucaultian workerist comrades back then, to repeat things that had already been tried in the past, imagining that they were doing something absolutely new and uh, that never happened before. So, uh, one, to give you one example of uh, how forgetting helps repeat the past. Uh, in um, Italian culture, it has, all, has been obsessed with uh, 
anniversaries, with centennials, you know, we keep celebrating the, these dates. Uh, however, in 1912, in 2012, we entirely overlooked uh, the centennial, the 100th anniversary of the Italian invasion of Libya. The Italian invasion of Libya in 1912, um, which uh, was also the context of the first aerial bombing in, in human history, where it, uh, we Italians inaugurated concentration camps in the desert, and the Libyans resisted us for 30 years, but no one ever told us this. So we choose not to remember that we had bombed Libya in uh, 2012, in, the, in 1912, and we celebrated the 100th anniversary by bombing Libya again in 2012. And in uh, treating the, we forgot that we had uh, brought thousands of Libyan resistors to concentration camps in Italy itself, to, to jail in Italy, and we gave the, exactly the same treatment, and we are giving the same treatment to the refugees from Libya and other war-torn countries that are coming to Italy and Europe today. So this is an example of how you forgetting um, causes you to repeat the past, to, uh, in the name of modernization, in the name of you know, democratization and change. On the other hand, uh, the, the distinction between remembering and forgetting is also debatable because forgetting is one of the crucial uh, tools of remembering. Memory is filled with oblivion. Uh, in uh, a tragic place of memory, Villa Grimaldi in Santiago, uh, Chile, where they held the, uh, the prison, uh, the, uh, the resistors that were arrested after the coup in uh, 1973, there's a phrase by uh, the Uruguayan poet Mario de Benedetti that says, El olvido está lleno de memoria, forgetfulness, oblivion, is filled with memory. And uh, as Jorge Luis Borges also wrote, el olvido es una de las formas de la memoria, su vago sótano, la casa secreta de la memoria. Uh, oblivion is the deep cellar, the underground, the secret side of the coin of memory. So, uh, Remembering everything, as Borges' memory, a uh, metaphor of the emperor uh, geographers teaches, means not that actually you remember nothing. And so this image uh, of um, memory and of the interaction of memory and oblivion also helps us understand that memory is not a place where you store data, where you... Uh, just uh, etch the traces of experience and learning, but rather a permanent se search for meaning in which forgetting filters out the uh, things that no longer have meaning. What did I have for lunch on uh, September 29, 1971? Mm -hmm. uh, just happened to be my father's birthday anyway. Uh, and. Uh, but also the things that have too many, too much meaning for us to, to countenance, to face. Uh, Borges' image of the cellar connects with uh, Mario Benedetti's image of oblivion as uh, a huge simulacra filled with ghosts. And ghosts are the memories that we suppress and that return to haunt us as, uh, as ghosts as nightmares as soon as we uh, relax our controls. So uh, th uh, this image of memory as something that we can maybe control, but also we cannot do without, we cannot suppress, uh, is um, repeated in a number of 
classic literary images. One thinks of uh, um, uh, Proust's image of the Madeleine, of uh, passages in Don de Lillo's Underworld, or the extraordinary image of involuntary memory that opens uh, Toni Morrison's beloved. You know, uh, when uh, Setha, the ex-slave protagonist, is flooded by the memories evoked by the smell of lavender flowers as she walks across the field, and the sap of chamomile plants that uh, evokes the images of the plantation where she was uh, where she grew up, and the pastoral beauty of the scents of the flowers evokes the horrors in the very process of covering them up. And I quote, nothing else would be in her mind, nothing, just the breeze cooling her face as she rushed toward water. Then something, the plashing of water, the sight of her shoes and stockings awry on the path where she had flung them, of the dog, lapping in the puddle near her feet, and suddenly there was a plantation rolling, rolling, rolling before her eyes. And though there was not a leaf on that farm that did not make her want to scream, it rolled itself out before her in shameless beauty. It never looked as terrible as it was, and it made her wonder if hell was a pretty place too. Fire and brimstone, all right, but hidden in lazy groves boys hanging from the most beautiful sycamores in the world. So uh, literature tells us a great deal about you know, uh, two forms uh, of memory. Memory as a pacifier and memory as disturbance. The cliche of memory as weight, mere repetition, is ultimately, you know, the result of what institutions often do with memory. Monuments, statues, uh, commemorations, celebrations, textbooks. And it's a memory that uh, has the aim of making us feel good about ourselves. How heroic we were, or how uh, ourselves as heroes, or ourselves as victims. How badly we were treated, and how uh, heroically we fought, hardly ever about with us as perpetrators, us as accomplices, us as you know, living, in, uh, living in ambivalence. And, uh, and I think one of the tasks of oral history is to um, articulate this kind of memory. Uh, memory that questions all narratives, not just the hegemonic narratives of the ruling classes, but also the established self-complacent narratives of the working class, of the people's movements, of the feminist story. You know, using memory to uh, undermine uh, what we take for granted. And I would like to discuss this function of memory as disturbance with a few examples from, from Italian history. Uh, 2011, the 150th anniversary of Italian independence. Suddenly, it became politically correct to wave the flag because, um, because we've, we've had uh, a long association with between patriotism and the flag with the, with the fascist tradition. So suddenly in 2011 it became okay to wave the flag, to uh, claim that, it's, that the unification of Italy was a good thing and everything. And I remember I was on a panel on the radio and one of the speakers said, uh, uh, we should never uh, narrate history through metaphors. I don't know why he said that, but uh, number one, I love metaphors. Number two, uh, the, what we were celebrating at that time, the risorgimento, was a metaphor. Risorgimento means a rebirth, a rising again, so as, as though Italy had been dead and in the grave, and it rose again. And I was immediately reminded 
of what Toni Morrison says. She says, anything dead coming to life hurts. So uh, I thought we cannot understand the meaning of our country's coming back to life unless we uh, investigate. Where does it hurt? Where does it hurt? Where, where does the glorious narrative of our nation building hurt? And of course, there are many critical history books about the contradictions of the Risorgimento and so on and so forth. But they all assume, you know, basically that this is our founding myth. Oral histories are different. And I learned the lesson, as uh, Alexander was saying, you know, the, the Trastulli uh, story had uh, moved me to try to write the history of the labor movement in Terni between 1949 and 1953. So in my first interview in this project, I talked to this man who told me how he'd been laid off in the 50s, he, the struggles, the work, and, and then his wife grabbed the microphone. This usually goes, uh, goes the other way around. You, know, you, you interview women and the, and the man takes over, or tries to take over. In this case, she grabbed the microphone, and, and she told the following story. My father's father, he joined Garibaldi. So this was way out of my agenda. This was 1860. You know. My father's father, he joined Garibaldi, and he went away with Garibaldi the day that he married my grandmother. She was 14, and he was 18. After the wedding, he said, all right. They went home, and he said, all right, I'm going to the store to buy some meat for lunch. You go home, you wait for me. And on the way to the store, he ran into Garibaldi and all his men that were on the way to Sicily, and he up and went to Sicily with Garibaldi to liberate Italy. And he, uh, by, uh, the, her grandmother waited at home for three days, waiting for him to come back from the store. And anyway, he came back four years later after liberating Italy. So, number one, the book that had started out to be 1949-1953 ended up being a book 1831-1985. <laughs> because you don't throw away a good story because it isn't true, like in the Trasulli's case, or because it's beyond your agenda. You know, one of the things you learn doing this trade is flexibility and serendipity. But so, what, was, what is interesting about the story is, you know, the, the foundation narrative, the glorious ancestor who liberated Italy with Garibaldi, and of course we're proud of him, uh, is also a memory of abandonment, of you know, of irresponsibility. I mean, you just married this 14-year-old kid and you leave her at home all alone because you're, you have more important things to do, you know? And, and in fact, and breaking with the family. She says, you know, after he'd done this, the family disinherited them, including the woman who had done nothing wrong. But, so he said, well, okay, I don't want your money. So they migrated from Romania and they came to Terni. So this was a really a founding narrative of how the family had come to Terni uh, after uh, being part of the founding narrative of, uh, of the country. And again, the pride and the hurt. You know, the grandmother abandoned the disinherited, the disinheriting of the family, the, mig the forced migration. And this, after I heard this, I started you know, asking, uh, you know, listening for Garibaldi narratives. Uh, you know, in Italy there's a, uh, a, the expression, when, when you want to say, you, you said something really bad, you spoke ill of Garibaldi, you know. So I started listening to a pr complicated story about Garibaldi. And another lady, also a descendant of, the, of Garibaldini. My grandfather, he was studying to be a priest, and he ran away from the convent. He took to the bush, he was in the woods, and Garibaldi came through the woods, and he went along with Garibaldi. And he ended up spending the family fortune for the cause. 
So in each birth of a nation narrative, you have a break and you have a healing. You have the dynamics of revolution and constitution, as in the case of you know the founding of the United States of America, of unification and conflict, as in the case of uh, the nation building of Italy. And in all these family narratives, joining Garibaldi, it's you know, Garibaldi always comes by. You know, he's always passing by. You know, if you go to Italy, um, half, everywhere you go, there will be a stone saying, Garibaldi slept here. Because <laughs> Garibaldi was really a hero on the road. He had long hair. And, uh, and you know, if you follow what he did, he really you know, walked, marched, rode north to south, east to west, all of Italy. So uh, you have all these narratives, and they're all stories about uh, breaks, breaking with the family, two brothers from Terni, quote unquote. They joined with Garibaldi, unbeknownst to their parents, they left a note and went away with Garibaldi. Or they break with the church, uh, the daughter of a, uh, of a resistance fighter in Rome, remembered that her great-grandfather had, had run away from the church seminar to go and fight with Garibaldi in the 1860s. It's a break with law and order. You know, Garibaldi comes through the woods, they take to the bushes, and the priest, the priest said, my parish priest who gave me my first communion, um, he, when I interviewed him here later, he said, well, the Garibaldini were really, they were a hot-headed bunch following a lucky bandit. Because, you know, this is the fault line across these narratives. Uh, they're the backbone of family pride, but they're also stories about you know, break with the family, about leaving the family. So, uh, a young woman from Terni. People keep telling me that those who joined Garibaldi were adventurers, people like that. This isn't true because this is not what my family is. So Garibaldi found the family's respectability. They joined him because they felt the passion for the patriotic cause. However, she says that her family is very proud that uh, her ancestors were friends with Garibaldi, Mazzini. However, they tend not to mention the fact that because they were friends with Garibaldi and Mazzini, their ancestors also spent time in jail. So one thing is to have uh, a heroic patriotic ancestor, and another is to have a convict. And uh, so, and this is a fault line because of course all liberators, all heroes were bandits before they became heroes, were outlaws before, before they, founded, established the new law, the new, the new order. So each birth of a nation is the creation of a new order, but also the hurt, the trauma, or the break, or the violation of, the, of an older one. And memory sets out to exercise this conflict, you know, to remember the glory and the glory days, if I may quote my favorite philosopher, and um, to <laughs> exercise the conflict, the break. And again, literature helps us here. You know, one of the founding nar uh, narratives of US literature is uh, Washington Irving's Rip and Winkle. And the story of Rip and Winkle is he falls asleep uh, before the revolution and wakes up afterwards. So you simply cannot countenance this. And interestingly, there is a little known story about in Italian literature that's exactly the same. Uh, Mastro Feluciano Pelosini falls asleep in 1848 in the Grand Duchy of Tuscany and wakes up in 1865 in the Kingdom of Italy. The throes of Risorgimento uh, have been entirely skipped and uh, pushed away from memory, but they come back. And in, uh, not so much in, uh, in the Italian story, but in Rip Van Winkle, there are visions. And there are visions of uh, the suppressed memory of discovery and of, uh, and of rebellion. So uh, 
in uh, there are three three R's in Italian history. Risorgimento, the Renaissance, um, uh, Rinascimento, the Renaissance, Risorgimento, and Resistenza. Now, both Rinascimento and, resi and, and Risorgimento are metaphors. Resistenza isn't, because this is what you know, the anti-fascist fighters in 1943, 1945, in Occupied Italy, did. And, um, and again, the narrative of resistance is, uh, again, a narrative, a heroic narrative, uh, and a narrative of nation building, because uh, the um, established narrative uh, shared by most political uh, parties in up until the mid-90s was Italy is a democracy born of resistance. And resistance was the rising of the Italian people against the Nazi occupation and the fascist dictatorship. Uh, one uh, of the most uh, widely used textbooks um, history textbooks in high school uh, says uh, that uh, in order to um, facilitate the, re the uh, reunification, the reconciliation, the, uh, and the democratic rebirth of Italy after the war, and I quote, it was necessary to manipulate, it was felt necessary to manipulate the story to give a unified narrative. And then it says, this is no longer acceptable. But that's exactly what happened. What happened on the one hand, you know, after the world, after World War II, another war started, the Cold War. And on the one hand, as when I was growing up, you just could not mention the resistance. And the teaching of history in our schools stopped at 1919, if we were lucky. Otherwise, it would have stopped at 1915. Uh, so we, did, we were not supposed to know anything about fascism and the war, because it was too controversial. And then, after political changes in the 60s, it became this pacified narrative that all Italians had joined in the struggle for democracy, which was also subscribed to by the communists, because having been in the resistance was what legitimized them uh, as part of the Italian democracy in Cold War. However, however, as, uh, so this was very much told as history's monument. Uh, many Italian towns have the monument to the, part, to the dying partisan, the partisans who gave their lives for our freedom. One of the most uh, important books that, was, that were published after the war was a collection of letters of uh, partisans written before they were, you know, be, before they were uh, executed by the by the Nazis or the fascists. It was very moving. And, uh, however, uh, my friend uh, Rosario Bentivegna, who was a leading a leading partisan in the in the armed resistance, remembers going to a school and talking about the resistance to the students, and then. This young woman, this student, gets up and says, "You know what? I'd always heard about you part uh, that you partisans gave it all life for partisans who died, but I've just recently heard that partisans also killed. I will no longer sympathize with the resistance after this, because we tend to forget that liberation wars are wars, you know, and that George Washington." Uh, you know, was uh, also helped kill some of the uh, 
so, uh, the, the red coats during the American War of Independence. So uh, this, uh, this is memory as disturbance. And what is, uh, again, fascinating is that you only find it in oral history or in literature. Some of the, most of the great books about resistance are problematic. Um, Italo Calvino and, and others, you know, Meneghello. They're, they do not debunk the resistance. They're all written from the point of view of anti-fascists, but they deal with the complicated subjectivity of human beings who were in a war and killed and killed. Killing is an act against nature, said my, my friend and comrade Carla Caponi. Uh, many of the uh, heroes and heroines of the resistance in Rome were women who fought gun in hand. And she says, you know, uh, whenever, when you kill, you also kill a part of yourself. And this is something that uh, it's very hard to formulate. Uh, Rosario Bentivegna, that I mentioned earlier, says uh, that I had chosen to study medicine because I thought that if I'm called to serve in the army, I will not have to kill, but I will do all I can to save lives. And after his first armed action, he says, we were in shock. I had shot a man. I couldn't speak. I couldn't go back and be with my friends again. And in order to do this, and I think this is the greatest sacrifice that the partisans did for our freedom, they had to suspend part of their humanity in order to wage this, this struggle. Maria Teresa Regar. Uh, it's as though we were shielded from everything, as though we wanted to protect ourselves from what we were doing because it was so abnormal for people like us. You know, this is the great difference, ultimately, between the partisans and the fascists. The fascists had a cult of death. They, uh, they, were, they went out as one, one memoir uh, has it, uh, one fascist memoir, seeking uh, in search of the beautiful death. Partisans didn't want to die. They, didn't, they wanted to live free. They were willing to take the chance, but they were not worshiping death. Theirs or their enemies. Um, and I'm dedicating this talk to Lucio Tobrini. Lucio Tobrini uh, passed away last Sunday at age 91. She was uh, a deeply religious woman and a fighting partisan. And probably the highest moments in all my listening in, uh, to resistance narratives was one day, you know, Lucia, Lucia refused to be interviewed. Lucia refused because she said, I don't want to talk about this. I don't want to, I don't want to remember this. People talk, talk too much about it. And so she wouldn't be interviewed. On the other hand, her husband, who is now 97, was more than willing to talk. And uh, so I would spend hours and hours at their home interviewing him. And she would sort of hover around, you know. Uh, would you like a glass of water? Uh, can I give you a cup of coffee? And then she would, uh, but so one day she comes in with a cup of coffee on the on the tray, and and her, her husband says, uh, Lucia, do you remember what the name of this person was? You know, you ask her for detail, and she sa she says the name, and then she talks for an hour and a half. And she is standing there with the tray, and I'm standing there with the coffee, and the, which is getting cold in it, but how can you drink that? And I'm odd. And she opens up. And she says, 
during the resistance, I thought, it's as though I were transgressing. I was ashamed to speak to him. And I said, you mean you were doing things that you thought Christ wouldn't understand? And she says, yes. It's only uh, afterwards that I found that I talked to Christ again. And when I think back on this, how strange, was it really me? So it's a, it was a different time, she says. Uh, it was abnormal, Maria Teresa says. Was it really me, she asks. And, and she talks about how she was actually the commander of a resistance unit that uh, f fought on the road between, from, between Rome, uh, Rome and uh, Tuscany. And, uh, and she remembers these uh, truckloads of young people that went, you know, this was the role of the retreat for the Germans. They went, uh, rode those trucks singing at home, at home, in the Heimat, in the Heimat, everything will be better. And she blew them up. And she says, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. She does not repent, you know, she's very proud. She, she also tells a story of when uh, uh, she was decorated. They gave her a silver medal and she, so that there's this ceremony and all the people that are being given the medal are lined up. And of course, most of, they're all men and here she is. So the Ministry of Interior that's pinning the medal on these people's chests comes up and she says, are you the widow? And she says, no, sir, I'm the one that's getting the medal. Because she's, again, the fault line, the pride, the fact that, they, that this was a just necessary, inevitable war, and the pain, and the pain of having gone against their own sense of their own humanity. My, uh, the first person from whom I heard the Trastulli narrative was, um, no, I'm ad-libbing this because I've, I've been thinking about uh, Lucia a lot. And I'm thinking of how, you know, she's trying to repress these memories, but then memories come back. And she says, uh, I, the only time I really started talking about the resistance was when my son was killed in a traffic accident. By, uh, and people were trying to console me, and, and I started talking talking, talking, I couldn't stop. And I was talking about the resistance. And so, it's, you know, it's the association between two deaths, deaths of young people, and, uh, and the pain, and the pain that comes back to haunt her again. To go back to Dante Bartolini. Dante Bartolini was, there are, basically two ways of talking, uh, of two narrative forms about the resistance. One is the epic, uh, and Dante is the epic storyteller of the resistance. Uh, and the other is the picaresque, uh, the, the anti-heroic narrative of the resistance about being hungry, being cold, uh, being bored, you know, uh, but Dante is the, mm, is the Homer of the uh, resistance in, the, in, in central Italy. And he has, and I mean, there are things that I didn't even realize when I was listening to the stories. And actually, I quoted this passage any number of times. It's quoted in my Terni book where he's describing how, what the, you know, their actions in the resistance and torching uh, Nazi uh, convoys along the road, burning um, armored, Nazi armored cars with Molotov um, bottles. And, and then 
I just saw this again for the first time recently, rereading this. Uh, and it says, and inside those uh, those trucks, those uh, there were those poor people that couldn't get out. I mean, even in the most heroic narrative about uh, what a glorious war it was. The enemy were poor people. And Lucia says, even the enemy is a man. Even the enemy is human. So, uh, th this is, um, on the one hand, this, this is the, what Claudio Pavone, who is our most important resistance historian, called the morality in the resistance. Uh, the uh, sense of the meaning of what you were doing and how difficult it is to remember and to and to narrate. One of the great epic narratives that um, you know, talk about unreliable stories. One of the great narratives that I got from Dante Bartolini who also wrote a song about this was the story of the great battle that 18 partisans fought against fought and won against 200 fascists in at Poggio Bustone Hill Village uh, between Terni and Rome. And uh, the um, climax of this battle was when uh, the leaders of the fascists, the officials, were Sur um, surrounded inside, you know, they, they were inside this house and, the, and they were surrounded. And here there's a, you know, stories just fan out. There are dozens of different versions of what happened uh, because they were killed. So one version is, uh, this is, this is a Western movie version. You know, one partisan came through the through the chimney, and uh, and you know behind them, they turned around, but he f he fired first. He, he was faster on the gun, and he killed them. Of course, this is not what happened. Uh, another narrative from the fascist side says they were surrounded, so so they went out to earned themselves a beautiful death. They came out, they were told, they were asked to surrender. They came out of the house shooting and they were mowed down by the So this was a beautiful death. The way Dante Bartolini tells it, and he was not there, so he's making it up. The way he tells it is, they were surrounded, so we told them come out. If you come out with your hands up, maybe uh, your life will be spared. They came out with their hands up and we moved them down. And we moved them down. This is not what happened. But what does the story mean? What does the story mean? What does this narrative mean? It has to do less with what they did than what was on their minds and, on, and in their hearts. Because he says they should have died along with the others. In a way, it's, a, it's an act of justice. You know, the fascist underlings have been killed, so why not the big guys? The big guys should die with them. He has a song about this battle, and he says, and again, it's unreliable, he says, that these people are now in, wa in jail waiting for judgment. No, they were killed, they were never. But what he's, t what he's talking about is, well, we were so angry, we were so filled with rage that no matter what happened, we would have killed them anyway. So this is a story not so much about what happened, but it's a story about the state of mind of you know, the, part, the, the fighter in the battle. 
even the partisan, even those who were fighting for freedom, justice, humanity, all these wonderful things, but in the battle. Uh, and also, uh, through the experience of being haunted down like dogs by the, by, by, by the Nazis, by the fascists. Uh, you develop feelings that, uh, that are very hard to remember and to explain afterwards. Just like Lucia couldn't talk to Jesus. Dante has no, Dante only has a, a fictional narrative to imply the anger and the hatred and the fury. There are not nice feelings. And in his song, in his song he says, you know, we heard that the Nazis were invading this village and the partisans came down like bloodthirsty wolves. Part the, you know, the partisans as bloodthirsty wolves. This goes against the rhetoric of resistance, the, but, and it's so difficult to articulate afterwards. And one of the men who, Mario Filipponi, who actually was at that battle, and he says, you know, you spent six months, eight months, a year in the mountains. When you come down, you're half, a, half an animal. There are no two ways about it. I was I wasn't a, a normal human being. Notice, non, I was a normal uh, uh, Maria Teresa. It, it was abnormal. Today I say I was an animal. In those days, in those times, I was out of my mind. You come down the mountain with all the hate, all the fighting, the guns, and all the time you expect to be shot in the back. So you bring yourself to such a frenzy that when it was over, it wasn't easy. It wasn't easy. So again, we have another narrative of nation building where, uh, where it hurts, where it hurts. And, uh, and I'm glad to be talking about this uh, in these days when we're all we're all thinking about uh, this great woman, uh, Lucia, Lucia Tobrini. There's a, a narrative gimmick that Don DeLillo uses in uh, Underworld. Uh, because the narrator has a memory that he keeps trying to, su to suppress the complicated relationship with his father, and the fact that he killed a mafioso, the killing of a, mafio of a mafioso in the Bronx. And he's trying, and whenever his stream of consciousness brings up this memory, it is interrupted by formulas. You know, whenever the name, you know, the father, the, he, the, he shifts and says, we brought my mother back to Denver, to, uh, to Tucson. We set her up with her own nice room and coat hangers. And this formula returns over and over again, the same in uh, this you know, reassuring formula. His, whenever the narrative skirts the, the, the dangerous thoughts that keep rising, like, like ghosts. On the one hand, uh, the, one of these, uh, one other formula concerns the disposal of domestic waste, you know, as so that on the one hand, in the in, as a form, the for, the formula blocks the uh, disturbing narrative, the memory as disturbance. On the other hand, whenever these ghosts are replaced by a narrative about disposing of garbage, it's a metaphor. It, re it represents it. You know, we, uh, 
somehow shift our, our narrative from what we don't want to talk about uh, to talk of other things. But then when we talk of other things, uh, the, uh, the disturbing narrative comes up. And I really don't know why the date, the insignificant date that I thought up a few minutes ago was my father's birthday. I really don't know. Thank you. <laughs>